this installment of Artist Dialogue, it's my honor to present a really good friend um, and an influence in our community, Christian Kabwai. Um, I'm just going to read his um, bio, if that's okay with everyone. Um, so Christian is an artist, entrepreneur, futurist, special, specializing in endangered writing systems from the Philippines as a leading authority for their propagation and instru instru instruction, sorry, of pre-Philippine scripts. He launched his own edutainment business specializing in custom art, books, events, technology, and apparel. Christian has spoken around the world at museums, schools, and companies. His work is wide reaching that spans across multimedia, traditional practices, and technology. He is currently working on his seventh book. I couldn't even start on my first, but here he's working on his seventh book, documentary education startup and learning traditional tattooing. Um, and with that, I'm gonna introduce Christian. Thanks, Christian. Hello, yes, thank you for having me. All right, um, so since we, um, we just have limited time, I'll just hop right into it. And then, um, then we're gonna do a quick little workshop, right? And then hopefully we'll have time for a Q&A after. Okay, um, so writing of the stinky fish. Uh, for those that don't know, um, in, in the Philippines, the, the, the national hero, Jose Rizal, uh, supposedly um, had this poem. And there's a, a saying that if you don't love your language or culture, you're worse than an animal or a rotten fish. That's kind of the loose translation in English. Um, and this is sort of the, I guess, something that um, I, I've taken on as, a, as an identity for my work. Um, and being in, in the diaspora in America specifically, uh, I'm asking like myself this question, you know, am I a uh, stinky fish or how do I be less of a stinky fish? And this is sort of that journey on how to be a less stinky fish. All right. So this is um, ultimately it's an immigrant story that um, many folks can relate to, uh, but it's also a journey of self um, discovery or rediscovery. Just like many of my generation, um, my family moved to the U.S. to um, escape from martial law in the Philippines at that time. And of course, the closest place, you know, besides Hawaii was California. And we obviously landed in the tropical paradise of San Francisco. Um, the very first apartment that we lived in, you know, was really small. And that's me because I was just a, a little guy. Um, and we lived here in the Mission District at Casa Dolores. Um, it was a one bedroom apartment with myself um, and my parents. And then my grandparents, they lived in another um, apartment. Um, apparently at that time, they didn't allow kids. Uh, my mom told me a story that she had to hide me from the manager because there were no kids allowed at that time. And last I checked, and this was pre-COVID, uh, that like a studio or one bedroom there was going for almost $3,000. So. I, I think we paid a lot less when we moved in there when I was a kid. And then, so typical story, moved to the city. And then, you know, my parents, they, they work hard. And what do you do when that happens? You move to either Daly City or you move to the East Bay. And this is the home in Fremont where I grew up. And, you know, we had a typical uh, Filipino uh, household, this couch, usually has plastic, but they took it off for the picture because when you take it with the flash, it, you know, doesn't look good. You know, we had the karaoke machine. That's my grandfather, my sister, my cousin, um, porcelain, uh, you know, flowers in there. So very typical Filipino household. Um, then, you know, I, I went to these uh, festivals and as Joe mentioned, you know, whether it's Fiesta Filipina that they used to have at Civic Center at the at the Bill Graham or over at Pistan, which still happens to this day. And growing up in my neighborhood, it was a really diverse um, neighborhood. We had every, almost every, I think probably representatives from every continent. So I learned a lot of different cultural traditions from, 
you know, my Korean friends, my Chinese friends, you know, my black friends, my Mexican friends, um, my Polynesian friends, it was very diverse. Um, you know, even our white folks were diverse. I had a friend that was from Australia. So that's something that I appreciated growing up. That's me, just kidding. But to be honest, I was salty uh, with my Polynesian friends. And that's because no one, they were popular. And two is because they had this, uh, I guess, cultural swag, right? And um, maybe many of you could relate is that we want, we, we had to kind of like um, gravitate towards like hula dancing and Tahitian dancing. And because it was very visual and there's a lot of Filipinos that, you know, went into that, that culture. And, but I was always wondering like, why is it that, you know, they have this certain, um, this certain, I guess, um, uh, cultural popularity at the time is how I would describe it. Um, but we didn't. Um, and we looked alike. The language sounded similar. The food is similar. But how come there is this difference? And that's when I learned about, you know, like the issues around um, how the Polynesian islands were appropriated, et cetera, et cetera. But that always stuck in my head. So we went to Hawaii on vacation. That's me. I hated it. They made us dress up in these outfits. Um, but I went to this place, which is now is really fancy, the international marketplace. And in the back of this, there was an arcade. And I went past all the aunties in the front and they thought I was a local boy. And I went to the back and I was talking to these, uh, these Hawaiian kids. We were playing video games and you know, they thought that, oh, um, oh, you're not from here. They thought I was local. And it just seemed very familiar. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it just seemed like a very familiar place. And it wasn't until I was an adult and I spent time traveling around the Philippines that, you know, there is a, a mother culture between the Pacific Islands, the Philippines, and other countries in Southeast Asia. Um, but this is kind of like my taste of that. So growing up, I had to do this family tree and I got excited. I, I went to my grandparents. Um, they lived in um, the Excelsior and we would go to their house and for you know family gatherings. And I got excited and I would ask them, um, I had to do this family tree um, because my parents, they, you know, they didn't really know that much about the extended family. So they said, oh, why don't you ask your grandparents? So I would ask them, my grandmother didn't really know much, but my grandfather, I know he likes to talk a lot. So I hit him up and he oddly didn't know all his brothers and sisters. And he had 13 brothers and sisters. Um, he wasn't that old at that time, but I just was trying to get more information, but I don't know why they wouldn't give me this information. Um, but the only person that I could find out who my great grandfather was is his name was Lolo Ting Ting. And to me, I said, what, what's that name? Ting Ting. And then, oh, because he was skinny, but he was, he was strong, like a Walis Ting Ting. And a Walis Ting Ting is like uh, made up of like really strong, but skinny branches um, or, or like um, stems from, from a plant. And I said, well, what's his real name? That's not his real name. And they said, no, I, they never told me his real name. Um, it, it was strange. So I go back to school and my classmates, you know, they come up with this family tree that's 10 generations deep. And oddly enough, they had, how can you have pictures from like before there were cameras? And they had pictures of the Duke of whatever. And, you know, it was deep. It was quite impressive. But then when I go up there, I had a bush. I didn't have a tree. My tree was a bush. It was sideways. It looked like this. I had my Lola, my Lolo. I couldn't put Lolo Ting Ting there because I would get laughed at. I was, I was ashamed, you know, quite honestly. And I put my dad, then all my, my titas, my aunties. So I had a bush and I realized that myself, the other Filipino kids, as well as the Mexican kids, we all had bushes, but then all the other folks, you know, they had like these big, massive redwood trees 
that come from Europe, that come from France and Germany and Italy. Um, and I couldn't quite um, figure it out at that time, but it just seemed kind of odd to me. And this is where I'm starting to formulate these questions in my head from school. Then in the 90s, um, I really got into hip hop. And at that time, a lot of the hip hop um, was, I, I would say, like uh, conscious hip hop. And they talked about things that are quite relevant to Wednesday that is relevant in the news today. Like I first heard about, you know, all of these things through Public Enemy. Um, talking about that, you know, talking about um, um, finding yourself, your roots, and and all of those things, and then that extends to Bob Marley as well. And back then, you know, CDs and records, they would have the lyrics, and reading the lyrics is where, you know, I that was my books at that time. Reading these lyrics, and then going back and asking and digging more, and that's where I kind of found, I guess, my consciousness around, you know, culture, like socioeconomic issues at that time. And then that also led to reading books by Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, um, studying about the Black Panthers. And I naturally then asked, internalize it, well, then who is, you know, the, the Malcolm X, the Marcus Garvey in the Philippines? Who's doing this, you know, where I'm from? And I didn't have an answer at that time. Because in the Philippines, then I learned, you know, we have our own black folks too. We have our own anti-blackness. We have our own, you know, colonial issues that, you know, we currently deal with today, not just a long time ago, but today. You know, then we have the issue of like, you know, skin whitening, you know, today. And I always wondered like, where did that come from? So growing up, um, my grandfather used to take me to Chinatown a lot. And we would walk up and down the hills and, you know, I would ask him, well, what, what are those writings on the, on the signs? And if you saw my grandfather, you know, he could pass for Chinese. And, you know, I was being, I don't know if I was being a little smart ass as a kid. I said, well, you look Chinese. Can't you read it? So I always found that kind of strange that, you know, he said, no, that's how they write in, 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 in China. And I asked him, well, how did you write in the Philippines? He said, we write in English. And it, I was probably like around eight years old. He said, wait, but you look, we look Asian or whatever. Why do we write in English? We don't write in a different writing system. And that's when I figured that, you know, there are different writing systems in different cultures. Yeah, then that led into reading a bunch of books as a kid, just exploring and, you know, my curiosity. And these ancient books, one day I went to the letter P. And I went to the letter P and I read about the Philippines and I saw this image. And this is an image of the Katipunan flag. The Katipunan are the revolutionary fighters that were um, um, seceding from Spain through you know, hundreds of years of colonialism. And when I saw this flag, it looked like a letter I. And I thought, that's kind of cool. A letter I probably stands for independence or independencia in Spanish. And when I saw that, I remember going to a festival um, in probably Civic Center, and I saw a flag like this. And if you see the KKK, it's not, you know, the American KKK. That is, you know, the names of the uh, revolutionary uh, fighters in the Philippines. And one of the flags had that sign on it. And when I asked, the, when I asked him, I said, what is that? And he said, oh, that's our old writing system. And that's when I learned that we have our own writing system in the Philippines. And it was at these events where I learned that we had different, um, different cultures, even within the Philippines. Um, when I saw this dance, um, I, 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 I'm used to the tinickling. I'm sure most of you have seen it, you know, with the bamboo and they're smiling and all of that. But then when I saw this, you know, we had the, we had the, the princess with her head up, you know, she's not trying to be sexy or play to the audience. She just did her dance and just walked off. And I thought that was kind of cool. It was different. And that's when I learned that there are multi multiple cultures within one culture. And so after high school, um, I went to the Philippines and I went to this um, temple called Mega Mall. And at the time, it was the biggest mall in the Philippines. And when I say mall, it's not like a 
ceremony and whatever, but this is where you could get a facelift, you could go bowling, you can go ice skating, you can go grocery shopping, go to art gallery, you could get your teeth whitened, you could learn how to drive. What else? There is just so much in this mall. It's like a microcosm of the whole country. And within this mall, I went to the National Bookstore, which is the place if you want to buy books. And I picked these two up because they didn't really teach us much uh, having um, um, a, an American education. So I picked these two books up. And now I have so, sort of a, uh, a book for the cultural um, history of the Philippines in the context of, say, like American um, occupation. Um, then I also found a chart of this writing system that I was curious about. And when I found the chart, I thought, okay, cool. But there wasn't that much history about it. It was just a chart with some dates on it, not much. And so what I first did when I went to the internet and I went on Yahoo, cause Google wasn't invented yet. So I went on Yahoo and I typed in, you know, Philippines writing system and it came out to be this website. Um, and this is one of the websites that I found at that time. And so what I did was I emailed the person here um, and we started corresponding and I learned a bit of that um, more historical context around the script. And this is another one um, by Hector Santos who is from LA. Uh, so at the time I also kept a blog and I called it conscious pages because, you know, I was trying to be woke or whatever at that time. It's very cringy, but I had that uh, Ka symbol that I found as a kid to sort of be the logo for that blog. And this is where I wrote about being a, an American in the Philippines at that time. Uh, this is a picture where um, a recreation of how I got versed in the writing system. Uh, my cousins, when we would go to uh, bars in the Philippines, they would call over people and kind of ask me to write people's names on napkins. And this is one, it says Nikki. Um, I, I just hope that no one got anything tattooed back then because I'm sure I wrote them wrong because I was just starting. But that was when I started to realize like there's value in this writing system. And then so of course, being an American living in the Philippines, after I finished college, everyone said that, hey, you should work at a call center. Maybe you could be a manager. You speak good English. You know, you don't even sound Filipino. And in my head, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm better than that. I'm not going to work at a call center. So what I did was, and I came back to America. And, you know, when I came back to America, you know, I was, I'm hyped up. I'm going to come back to America and teach these Filipinos, this culture, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I lived in Tracy, California, um, because that's where my parents were. So the only job I can get in Tra Tracy, California was a call center job for restoration hardware. So I left the Philippines because I didn't want to work at a call center to only live in Tracy, California to work at a call center, getting yelled at by rich people because their ottoman is late for eight hours. So I was kind of depressed. Um, and when you're kind of depressed and homesick, you get a tattoo. That's, you know, what you do when you're being sad, you know, but so I hit up this tattoo artist named Alex Figueroa and we started talking about the script and they said, Hey, you should, you know, post this online and, you know, teach people about it. And I thought no one wants to learn about this stuff, but I took his advice. And so I put it on MySpace and Friendster um, but there wasn't that much happening on MySpace and Friendster if anybody was on that back then. It was just a lot of flashing glitter and, and weird music and things like that. Um, so I taught myself how to make websites and I started a website called PinoyTattoos.com. And that was a website that's specifically just for pictures of Filipino tattoos. And I just uploaded a photo of my arm and gave the breakdown and a little bit of the the cultural history around it, um, then people started to contact me. Um, people would ask me things like this. Can you help me translate my name? My father was Filipino, passed away, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know much about the Philippines or I married a Filipina. I want to learn more about our culture. 
So I started to get these um, correspondence uh, via email um, weekly. And I started to realize that, wow, this, this writing system is, is a tangible living cultural asset. And people use it as a jump off for something. So you can use a, a, a cultural asset to educate yourself or to gain compassion for another person. So I started to learn as I started reading more of these stories. But I didn't want the script in my context just to be about tattoos. So I started a website that specifically was around just about the, the script, the, the socioeconomic issues, the artwork in the diaspora as well as in the Philippines. And I coined these terms, pre-Filipino, pre-Philippines, because when I would speak about it, um, at first I would use terms like uh, pre-colonial, pre-Hispanic, and it would just gloss over people's heads. But when I said pre-Filipino, pre-Philippines, it was like a, a, a punch to the gut because then people would say, well, what does that mean? And that is the question where you can build a conversation around it. And as I started to um, get more versed about, you know, making websites and e-commerce, you know, it, I gained another skill um, around this practice. And that's where I started to diversify my interests. Um, so here are some pictures where people use it as tattoos. Um, I started to do more artwork as I started to have more income, um, some collaborations. Uh, people then would ask like, hey, could you paint this live? And at first I thought that, you know, why would you want to watch literally paint dry? Um, but at these events, people, they would watch me paint, but then the value was then after with the conversation, like people would come out of the woodwork and, you know, ask me these questions and, and invite me to speak to their students, et cetera. And this is where you know, I learned a lot more about how a cultural asset has value within the community. And then this left one is on Union Square, the right is at a, a winery. So it, I've traveled all over uh, doing this and speaking to different people. And this is a, um, in the Asian Art Museum where they had a, a calligraphy exhibit um, for all Asian writing systems. And this was the first time they had um, a Philippine script uh, represented in the museum. And since that went, you know, kind of viral, it, you know, I started to do it at more places. And this is a project where I'm exploring technology. Um, and this is a robot that is um, mimicking my uh, writing system. And so the thought here is this specifically, you know, within say San Francisco, we're like, we're like the technical techno hub of the world, but where, how does it intersect with cultural practice? Um, this is um, in virtual reality um, where I'm writing the script, trying to capture the strokes. Then um, it enabled me to kind of travel. And when I traveled, then I got to meet other communities um, that are kind of like how say San Francisco was or Daly City specifically like 30 years ago, um, I see that group say within in London, they're starting to have kids, they're becoming professionals, but then now they're starting to go back within their, their culture so that they can pass it on to the next generation. Um, yeah, so I speak a lot. Um, these are some of the places I've spoken and here are some of the projects, uh, some books. Uh, clothing. I did an app about um, the script a few years ago. This is a failure. Um, this is a project that I did where it's supposed to yeah, in our language means they, and it was supposed to be a, a scent, a perfume that can be used either feminine or masculine. And I discovered why CK1 is the best of all time because it's very difficult to do. But I wanted to explore um, these more mainstream products to tell the story of our people, like Sha, like before the pronouns and they and them, we already had that, you know, within our culture. Um, now I'm doing uh, things like Instagram filters and kind of extending the work in a different space. Um, this is that uh, project. Uh, this is a screenshot of a film that I'm doing called A Writing of the Stinky Fish. 
And the, the latest um, adventure is I'm learning a traditional tattooing from Lane Wilkin on the right, who is a uh, Filipino American. Um, okay, so real quick, before we go on the writing exercise, um, we're good with time, Joe? Okay. Um, so this is going to be part of a uh, Balai school. Balai school is uh, is my startup, which is an an online cultural school because I I've, I've always uh, wondered um, and been frustrated is that I have a lot of um, um, friends who send their kids to say after school like Chinese school to or he, to learn Hebrew to learn Arabic and I'm all wait. How many Filipinos are within the Bay Area and we don't have our own cultural school? I mean, or even like a daycare, like a, like a Kumon. That is a big business opportunity. If we had in every plaza that has a Jollibee or a seafood city where, you know, in the future, you know, you could bring your kids where they can have an after school program, but then also learn, you know, that is a moneymaker. But I understand the challenges to set up a physical space. So I thought about, what if I do it online? So this is a preview of what you know I'm doing online, starting with the writing system. And it's called a sulat school. Sulat means to write. So here are the basic characters. I'll go through this real quick, and then we're going to do a little exercise on uh, how to write a couple words. So there are three vowels. Uh, this is the a. This is the e or e. This is the o or u. And that's it three vowels, and these are the 14 consonants. Um, ba, da, ga, ha, ka, la, ma, na, nga, pa, sa, ta, wa, and then ya. So that's it. And then you'll notice that um, each character, it, it's not just like, this isn't just Y, it has an inherent ah sound. And that's what makes it an alpha syllabary. It's not Y, it's ya. Then say kudlit, kudlit means a, a mark, a hash. And these dots um, are how you change the vowel sound. If there's like a dot at the top, it makes it a be or b. If it's at the bottom, it is a bo or bu. And let's say we want to get rid of the vowel. We would, oh, but before that, if you notice that there's two, two um, characters, right? Two sounds, it's either an E or I. And that's because within different Philippine languages, it could mean the same thing, but different pronunciations. It can be an E or E sound, or it can be an O or U sound. Um, and because now we use English a lot in our correspondence. Sometimes we mix it up and we get, you know, signs like that because we don't have the long E sound. And so if we wanted to cancel the vowel, um, we would use what's called the Varama. Varama is a, is a Indic word, Indian word, where it means a pause, a stop. And we would use either like a plus sign or an X or a little hash to cancel that vowel. So this is the Ba character. And if you have any of these, it would cancel the vowel. Okay, so remember each, I said each um, character has a vowel a uh, after it. So let's read this together. Um, all right. And the count of three one, two, three. Ba, ka, wa, la, ka, ma, ga, wa. Ba, ra, ma, sa, ya, ka. Ta, wa, ka. Ha ha ha, ta wa pa, ha ha ha, ta ma na, pa ra ka na ta nga. Anyone want to translate? So basically, basically what you read. Anyone want to translate? Who wants to go off mute and translate? Joe, you're laughing, so you know what it means. <laughs> I I only knew the last two words, which. And the ha 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 actually made it funny, but um, I didn't know what we were saying until the very end. So I can't translate the entire yeah. thing. Does anybody yeah. else know? Elizabeth? Yeah, so basically what, oh, you want to translate it? Yeah, I think the first line is say, 
you don't have anything else to do. Yeah. Thing like that. Yep. And then the, the, let me see, one, two, three, the fourth line, say H, I mean, ha ha. Mm -hmm. That's enough. Yep. And then like and the then second the one. The last one, I think it's a, you look stupid or something. Yeah. So basically in English, it's, it's, um, um, maybe you don't have anything to do. It's like you're happy. Laugh, ha ha. Laugh more, ha ha. Stop. You're looking stupid. And so basically, you know, because of the, the way the writing system works, what you read was this. Um, and that's the way that our language works. It's, it's pretty simple. Okay, so let's do a quick little workshop. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and we're going to write, um, Joe and I actually um, selected a couple words. Um, and then, and while I'm do, setting this up, if anyone has any questions, um, I can answer. So let me share this. All right, let me reshare my screen. Okay, where am I? All right. Okay, you see this white? Okay, so the first word that we're going to write, and I'll write it in English first, um, it's going to be this. Mahal. And the reason why I, I like this word is because Mahal in, in Philippine languages, uh, it could mean two things. It could mean love or it could mean expensive. Um, it's the root word is an Arabic word, um, Mahal. Like if you've heard of like the Taj Mahal in India, uh, Mahal means like a big, great hall. And if you know the story of um, the Taj Mahal, you know, he made it for his, the love of his life, et cetera, et cetera. So my theory is that in some way during the trade and cultural exchange is that he figured out that love and wealth is the same thing. So we use the same word for it. All right. So um, writing this word mahal, um, we have, I'm going to write the first character. I'm going to show you how to write it um, traditionally. So we have, if you write this character right here, it's like a V. If you write this V, you can write many different characters. You can write the ah character. You can write the, the pa character. Um, but the ma is basically like this. That, oh, let me, at its basic is like that. So you can write it like this. You can write it like that. So basically that is the ma character. Okay, and because there's already an ah sound inherit, right? So we're just writing this character, ma, ha, and then we'll do that. So there's three syllables. And then so the ha is like this. So we have the ha. And if you're writing traditionally, and this is the way we wrote before, that's all we would write. We wouldn't write the last, we wouldn't write the L because we were scratching it in wood and it is very laborious. And before our circle was so small, like for example, like I would know, say, um, let's say we're in, you know, one community. I know the role of, of uh, uh, Stephen and, and the role that, that Stephen plays within the community. It, say Joanne is the, is the hunter. And so I would know the words that Joanne would speak. It would be different than say, for example, the farmer, et cetera. So we had context. So we know what they would write in the words. So this two characters, it would be Maha. That's what it would be written as, but it would be assumed as Mahal. But say we want to write in the modern way and add the L, it looks like this. And so now we have ma, ha, la. And the way that we cancel the vowel for the last character is that 
I like to be just using X, like X to cancel. So this is how you write Mahal. All right. Okay, then let's do um, let's do another word, which is I like the ones with like double meanings. Um, I'm gonna write this in, and I'm writing these in uh, in Tagalog. And this says uh, "bagong taon," and it literally says um, "bagong new" and then "year." Taon is like year, or or like age. Um, and but this "bagong taon," this phrase means "new year." So we'll write it traditionally first. And so "ba" is commonly written like that. the The main shape is actually a circle. But when you're scratching on bamboo and it's curved, you would use two strokes because you might you might uh, cut yourself. So it just makes it easier with two strokes when you're carving it. So his ba, and then this is the ga sound, right? And that's traditionally right. So we have ba ga, and then the way that we change the vowels is that. Because right here we have ba and then go, right? We put this kudlit, this marker at the bottom. So we have ba go. So that's traditionally how that is written. And then we're going to do this part right here. So we have the ta, which could be kind of hard to write. So we have ta. And then the o part will be like this. So this literally these two characters is tao. So this could be interpreted in a couple ways. So bago and then tao, and that could mean new person as well. Um, and so I, I like how, you know, sometimes it can shift depending on the perspective and context. Um, so that is traditionally how we would write new year, but I like to write it traditionally because it can also mean new person. Um, and then we have one more, um, and we're going to do this word right here. And it is pig sa. And this is a different, this is a Ilocano, which is a language um, from the Northern Philippines that, uh, that Joe speaks. And um, this is going to start off like this. This is the pa. All right, so we're going to break it down. We'll break it down. We'll do it the modern way. So this is the pa, and then we'll write the ga, and then we will write the sa. So we have the base characters, and we have pa, ga, sa. And in order to make it pig sa, we'll add the kudlit, the marker, at the top of the pa to make it pi. And then we're going to cancel the vowel under this G, this ga character there. So now it says pig sa. There you go. And uh, Christian, can you explain what pig sa means? Oh, yeah, sorry. It means um, strength. Pig sa. Cool. Um, we have three minutes left in our program. Um, thank you, Christian, for for taking us through your journey and um, teaching us how to write these actually really great words, especially to start to uh, to start our new year. Um, can you tell everybody how they could find you, how they could um, reach out, and if you have any questions, how um, people can correspond with you? Oh yes, definitely. And I have a slide for that. Um, let me, let me share my screen. Um, yeah, you can reach out to me. Um, here's my information, uh, for the online school that's launching hopefully in a, in a couple months, um, balayschool.org, get on the mailing list, but my email is down at the bottom, my websites, uh, you can find me all over social media. Yeah. 
thank you so much, Christian, for um, for being here. Does anybody have any questions for him before we go? Actually, I have a quick question. Yes. Okay, in Pigsa, why for the for the pa sound you put the kudlit up above? Yes. And what's the what's the differentiation between that and then putting the the canceling of the ah sound? Oh yes. So um, let me share. So the way that uh, it works is that if there's uh, canceling it removes a vowel, like the second character. Um, and oh. you can look at it this way, like for example, when when I, you can actually, when you add an X under there because there's no vowel after it. So you can kind of translate it like, all right, one-on-one. -on -one. So there's a PI. So then at the top, it is the, the vowel marker to make it a I or E. And then this one right here, there's no vowel. So I'm gonna cancel it, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, and then the saw. Oh, was, gotcha. Yeah, if this was an O, then you would put the marker at the bottom. Oh, okay, got it. Yep. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, you're welcome. Anyone else have questions? I, I can I see what you guys wrote? Did you? You can't see mine because. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can see it. This is great. Would you mind if I take a screenshot of everybody and, and what they wrote? Okay, cool. One, two, three. Dope. Okay, great. Um, any other last questions for, for Christian? No? But thank you everybody for, oh, Liz, I see you mouthing something. Did you wanna say something, Liz? Christian, thank you for educating us with this by buy buy-in. I never know about it. And it's very pretty writings. Thank you thank so you. much. Yes, definitely. So yeah, I hope everyone stays safe and thank you for having me.